Geothermal power is one of the world's greenest and most reliable energy sources. But it's also one of the most frustrating. For years, it's been confined to just a few spots around the world that happen to meet the right environmental conditions. But major advances in technology promise to usher in a potential geothermal golden age at a time when the planet desperately needs more green energy. Now, Vijay, let's start with some basics. Uh, what is geothermal energy? Now, geothermal is nothing new. The ancient Romans tapped into the heat under the earth uh, to you know, heat their baths, for example, 2,000 years ago. And 120 years ago, uh, Italians figured out how to harness the steam that was near the surface to turn a turbine and make electricity. So it's been around. In Iceland, there's a lot of it about. Uh, simply put, the way that geothermal uh, has been harnessed is we're in the few places on Earth where uh, they are lucky enough to have heat, fractures, naturally occurring fractures, and some steam. Uh, it can be brought to the surface pretty easily by basically sticking a straw in the ground, not too deep. If you can do all those things, and there's not many places where you can do that, then you can make electricity with a turbine at the surface. That's geothermal energy today. And frankly, because all those conditions are fairly rare, it's far less than 1% of global energy. And just, just to be clear, that when, we, when the steam, the heat is coming from rocks underground that are hot, and they get hotter as you get to the center of the Earth. It's as simple as that, essentially. Yeah, there's heat everywhere, of course. You just have to go deep enough. But in some places, uh, they are closer to the surface. In some places, they're further away. And some places have natural fractures that allow water to pass through ultimately steam, and other places are impermeable rocks, and those are much harder and have not uh, been amenable to the easy kind of conventional geothermal that we're used to. And, and you've hinted at this already. So not many places around the world have managed to harness geothermal energy for some of the reasons you've said, which is that you need to have the energy available relatively shallow, so two to four kilometers. But it's not just that uh, all these conditions need to be there. It's quite difficult to, um, you know, stick your straw in the ground in exactly the right place. And so um, because drilling is very capital intensive, there are a lot of dry holes that people get in this business. And therefore, it's very hard to finance geothermal. Um, and ultimately, unlike oil and gas, where people will put up with a few dry holes, because what you get can get is oil that's very valuable in the market. Yeah, everyone wants oil. Let's remember, what you get is, is steam, right? It's, <laughs> it's not that valuable in and of itself. So you have to have a, a, a contract for 30 or 50 years. And in other words, it's, it's a hard financing model if what you're drilling at great risk and expense is just to get hot water. And so that's why it's been hard to develop this industry in the past. What is it that's allowed this new optimism that sort of got everyone excited? To put it very simply, it is the surprising convergence of big tech's thirst for power with big oil's dr drilling innovations. That's what's happening. Uh, and it's been happening quietly in the margins, just off screen. And now this convergence of the thirst for power for these AI data centers and the willingness to pay by the big companies like Google, Meta, and the others uh, has met with interesting innovations like hydraulic fracturing, which we know, know of as fracking, uh, multilateral drilling, seismic observations and technologies that relate to the stuff that made the shale revolution work has now arrived in this kind of stodgy old fashioned business of geothermal. And that explains the revolution. We're about so to so the, the, the tech companies that need loads and loads of power for everything from data centers to, well, obviously, AI training and all the other things, they have been sort of pushing forward or, or supplying the money to that innovate in an area that's been around for a long time, but ha hasn't had the, had, the, had the capital or the money to do so. Is that, that's what's going on. What's interesting is um, some startup guys, some academics, they got together and said, look, why don't we apply some of the technologies and try changing how drilling is done? So we don't just have to have this magic conditions, this sort of you know Goldilocks spot where we can find geothermal, but we could find it almost anywhere. It was an unproven thesis, not very uh, successful 20 years ago, but they've shown it's not only correct, but it's just moving at astonishing speed. Well, what is the vision here? Well, what is the potential if you can get these new technologies that we'll, we'll discuss? If we can get them to work, then, then, then how much is there out there? The thing to know is the new way of coming up with geothermal, uh, next generation geothermal, unlocks a, a triple green advantage. Right, uh, well, you get the clean power, but you get something that you don't get with wind and solar, which are intermittent. That is, you get what's called firm power, meaning 24 seven. A geothermal well runs all the time, and that's perfectly suited to base load or to AI data centers in particular, but other kinds of applications. 
Uh, it's even more reliable than nuclear power, which we've seen around the world, it has lots of outages and engineering design flaws. Geothermal often has multiple wells, and so you have a bit of redundancy built in, actually. So you have firm power. And the third bit, which is the most novel concept, is that it can be used for energy storage. You can turn a geothermal well off and on without harm to the technology or the reservoir to get not just hours of storage as we can with lithium ion batteries for the grid, but even days of storage. So what is the first of the technologies that has kind of really started to make people think that geothermal could be this source of uh, this firm power, that this base load power um, in, in many, many parts of the world? So just take me through an example of one of the places you went to to see this in action. There's a project in Utah where you will find uh, a Department of Energy research station classic old style government funded research station that's been going for a couple of decades doing cutting edge work, trying to apply what's called enhanced geothermal. It's a new approach and it's come about in large part thanks to American government funded research supported by both Democratic and Republican administrations, including, perhaps surprisingly, the current Trump administration. So startups like Fervo, which is a, a clean energy company that's worth more than $1.4 billion dollars, uh, have really been pioneering this form of geothermal extraction. The company was founded by a few Stanford graduates and has been backed by Bill Gates, Google, and other big Silicon Valley entities. And they've been able to achieve dramatic improvements in the last few years with uh, how quickly and how effectively they can drill their uh, multilateral wells, meaning in multidirectional, but also with fracking and to get uh, energy out of the ground. How does a typical well that Fervo is, is making, how does it sort of, what does it do? How does it extract the energy? And what is it doing that's different to the traditional geothermal energy? Rather than sticking one straw in the ground, you can imagine they're actually going to stick two straws. And the two straws are actually bendy straws, just to be a bit simple-minded about it. The day I was there, they had drilled about 9,000 feet deep into the ground, had turned it, at roughly 90 degrees, a slow turn, but nevertheless, 90 degree turn, and went in a few more thousand feet in one direction. In the horizontal direction then. So they've gone down and then they go horizontal. Exactly. Some distance away, a parallel well was also built, going down roughly the same depth and turning and going again horizontally. But the two don't meet. They stay some distance apart. And this is where the magic happens. They use the technique of hydraulic fracturing which is fracking the rock, to create fractures in the rock that did not exist before. Water is then pumped down through those wells into those cracks underground, effectively creating an artificial reservoir a few kilometers below. And that picks up the heat from the ambient temperature, which is 150 to 200 degrees Celsius. And that heated fluid gets sucked up through the second straw, back to the surface, where through a series of steps, it ultimately turns a turbine to create electricity. So in a simplified way, they pump the water down, it gets heated by uh, the earth in the, it, within those fractures, and it gets drawn up through the second straw to turn a turbine ultimately. This is important because it takes a lot of luck to make traditional geothermal work. You need the right kind of rocks at intense heat and pressure and at relatively shallow depths. It all sounds very logical and very obvious in some ways, doesn't it? G g g given the technology is already available through shale oil, that this, this, this hasn't been tried for so long. Well, I mean, this has been on the books for decades. People have conceptualized it, but actually doing it, let's remember a couple of decades ago, the, the, the shale frackers got into some trouble because it was poorly regulated. They'd get in there and they'd use nasty chemicals. There'd be earthquakes because they didn't do it the right way and it wasn't well monitored. So this was a dirty word. There's still parts of the world, like the UK, for example. Where fracking is banned, yeah. Right. And so uh, you can't just try it. And so this has been a very risk averse industry, and especially if you recall, I mentioned it's also one that's financially constrained. Wells are expensive to drill and the way they drill is different from the oil and gas guys. So you have, one has to learn new tricks. So this is really learning by doing. And that's the story of the last 10, 15 years. How close is it to actually making this work at a commercial scale and selling energy on the grid? So this is the interesting part of the story. There are lots of pilots and we know the history of um, Energy is littered with death by pilot. Uh, many, many great ideas come along and they can't get the capital to build their first commercial scale plant. This is what's different about Furbo. Uh, not only have they demonstrated it, but they've got a power purchase contract with uh, Californian Utility, the largest commercial contract in the industry's history um, to develop uh, several hundred megawatts of power to sell. And they're gonna start producing early 2026. In fact, imminently, uh, they're about to produce commercially 
paid for power. And that's the first time really in this industry we've seen the new technologies achieve a commercial breakthrough like that. What about some of the challenges that are still left? You mentioned earthquakes before, and I think anyone listening to this and hearing the word fracking is thinking that the same thing. Um, when it was introduced in various countries, there were localized earthquakes that were sort of proven to be coming from these drilling technologies. Um, are people not concerned about that anymore? Uh, you're absolutely right to point that out. And indeed, people are concerned about that. Um, whether it was in Switzerland or in C South Korea, uh, several other countries, they had experiences of uh, quakes and, and rightly so, the community was alarmed. But in the last 20 years, part of what the lessons learned are monitor, monitor for quakes, catch them early, but also to use it in real time as a feedback loop to direct when you guide your uh, drilling. They don't simply go down willy-nilly or turn it too sharp an angle, for example. Clearly, this is a technology that is um, on the verge of becoming you know, huge. But just can you stand back and tell me how important will something like geothermal be then for the future of energy? So uh, rather than offering my prognostications, I'll rely on a couple of official forecasters. Uh, America's Department of Energy, they've been rapidly updating their own forecasts. Uh, and the, the latest big study on this um, suggested that if policy challenges that are in the way can be uh, fixed, and we can talk about that in a moment, that the technologies have the potential to achieve three times the energy output of all of America's nuclear power plants today by 2050. That is, from being virtually nil, less than 1% today, to being massive. The International Energy Agency, which of course looks globally, and they've done a terrific report that's fairly recent, they think that, uh, again, if we get the policies right, they predict a trillion dollar investment boom by 2035, which is actually fairly soon. And the game changer here really is the fact that this can be used, geothermal, with some of the new approaches of next generation, can be used for energy storage. All right. Well, look, uh, th th there's, all of this has been great to understand what the potential is. But again, I'm curious to know from you where the final roadblocks to this all happening are. What are your sort of thoughts about how this becomes global? So I would say three things need to happen for this really to have a chance to take off. First, I think regulations have, that are outdated and complicated have to be simplified. People haven't really thought about regulating it properly. It's been lumped in with oil and gas regulations, or some countries it's lumped in with mining. And, and heaven forbid, mining is one of the most uh, you know, industries that are slowest moving in America. It takes like 28 years to get an approval of a mine and get it going. And so uh, Indonesia, for example, has clarified its rules so that geothermal has its own rules separate from mining. In Texas, it was lumped in and regulated by three different regulatory agencies. It was a morass. So recently, they simplified that a couple of years ago so that one regulatory agency, one-stop shopping, and all of this provides clarity for investors, fast track, and make sure that this is not the same as oil and gas fracking, which uses nasty chemicals. And so it's regulated in a, in a different and more efficient way. Second is the seismic supervision. It might be that a country like Argentina, where there is a fracking industry and they're encouraging it, may well advance further because the regulators are knowledgeable and more comfortable with how to supervise it properly. And the third thing I think is I've alluded to is recognize the value of energy storage. We tend to go towards new supply and not think so much about potential sources of, of demand management or, or time shifting, uh, virtual power plants and so on. And so energy storage is a huge game changer. So if we were to rejig market roles in a way that makes sense to enhance grid stability, not particularly to help geothermal, it would help any kind of energy storage or technologies at time shift, then I think that would be a, a tremendous boon to this industry in particular. BJ, thank you so much for your time. It's been a great pleasure, Alec.